Welcome everybody. My name is Max Grünberg and I'm a PhD student here at uh, HFG Karlsruhe and also uh, part of the research group KIM, which studies artificial intelligence and media philosophy. And this semester I offered a course, uh, which is called Post-Capitalist Trajectories. And our starting point uh, here um, to explore heterodox mode of productions was, of course, uh, this notion by Mark Fisher, uh, which he called capitalist realism, this grip that um, sterilizes our imagination to imagine a feasible working alternative to the current system we have. And to, to cure us or counteract this, this grip, we um, began by reading the Utopian Socialists. After that, we identified the gap in Marx and Engels um, that they did not leave behind a blueprint. And in the second part of the semester, we explored uh, models that are proposed today how such a, a society might function. And because the students were so interested in these models, we skipped the historical part on um, media technological experiments that were taking place in the Soviet Union, but also uh, in Chile. And the latter uh, example of, of such an experiment, which is Project Cybersyn, is probably uh, much more uh, popular. And I'm very grateful that we have an expert today who uh, will tell us more about the project, but also his research on it. And I have a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Diego Gomez Venegas, who is a media researcher and media artist based in uh, Berlin. He holds a Master of Fine Arts in Design and uh, Media Arts from UCLA and at Humboldt University Berlin. He is currently pursuing a PhD under the supervision of Wolfgang Ernst and Hans Christian von Hermann with the title Encode, Forget, Govern, a Media Archeo genealogical inquiry on Project Cybersyn. And I hope in the talk, which will be, um, I think, more or less 45 minutes, um, we hopefully learn what the difference between a media uh, genealogical and media archaeological uh, inquiry uh, might be. And before I hand over to Diego, uh, we, after the talk, there will be time for Q&A. For everyone who feels uncomfortable talking, can simply write their questions in the chat. For everyone else, just raise your hand or um, signal that you have a question with a cue or something in text. So, uh, Diego, the stage is yours. All again, I'm sorry. So, okay. As I was saying, I think the, the, the title of the presentation deserves a comment. And this comment will be a two question comment. So first, reverberations of what and reverberations to where. Regarding the first question, I would say that we are talking here of rever epistemic reverberation. And regarding the second one, I would say with this presentation, what I want to convey is, uh, or to talk about reverberations going to cyber scenes present or future, which is our present, but also uh, reverberations going to cyber scenes past, but also reverberations coming from the past to cyber scene, and reverberation coming, coming from our present to cyber scene. So in a way, we are talking about cyber scene here as a node within a major network of reverberations that come and go in different directions. So that as a comment. So to start, and because of that, uh, I have divided the presentation in four sections, <clears throat> a short introduction, uh, then, uh, a section I call conditions of possibility, uh, with which I want to uh, present the way in which a certain uh, 
cybernetic thinking emerged in Chile between the years in the, during the late 1960s and the early uh, 1970s. And then I will go to the governing principles of Project Cybersyn itself. That is to say, uh, the operative behavior sustaining Project Cybersyn. And I will end with the section I call Techno-Epistemic Reverberation, which of course will deal with uh, how more specifically, uh, some techno-epistemic reverberation is connecting Project Cybersyn with our present. So to begin, um, let me, yes, read this. Cybersyn was a network of telecommunications and a processing system developed in Chile between the years 1971 and 1973 as part of the socialist reforms pushed by the government of Salvador Allende, aiming to constitute an advanced technology of management for the industrial economy of the country. The project was designed and directed by the British Cybernetician of Management, Stafford Beer, and developed and implemented by a local team of engineers and technologists. Okay, so this picture, uh, actually Max Greenberg uh, sent me this picture last week. And as we can see, uh, or we can imagine, uh, refers to a uh, storage facility here at Kasjue uh, Hochschule für Gestaltung, in which we see uh, a reproduction of one of the chairs located at CyberScene's operations room. This chair actually uh, refers to, to this. And this is the brochure of an exhibition that took place between Santiago, Chile and Karlsruhe. Okay. Uh, it was a project uh, done by a Chilean art collective called ORAM or O-R-A-M in connection with ZKM. So, so far I understand here the picture of, the, the original picture of the ops room. So far I, I understand um, the product design department here at this university made two replicas of the chairs. One was located at ZKM and the other one was located in Santiago at uh, La Moneda Cultural Center and the chairs were interconnected. So people could uh, experience an interconnection using the, the, the chairs. So this is, I, I'm mentioning this because so far, every account of Project Cybersyn has been focused uh, on the operations room and the chairs are taking all the, all the protagonic roles uh, so far. Yeah. And this is important because we, we see, we know, and we understand that particularly the, the, the image, uh, this photograph or this set of photographs uh, of the operations groups are probably the most compelling component of the project. And Stafford Beer, the director of the project knew this, and we can see this through in this, uh, Telex, this telegram he sent to Hermann Schwember in November 1972, uh, in which he asked if it was possible to make a color film of the operations room. Beer knew that because of this iconic characteristic or uh, stylistic character of the room, um, this could convince the general public in Chile in particular of supporting the project, which was something important at that moment. The academic research 
on project cyber scene, I think it would be fair to say, uh, is supported by two main pillars. Uh, and I, I, would, I, I think it's fair to say that the first one is the one uh, we could call the media historical one. And the second one, the social STS or social science and technology studies. In the first one, uh, I think the, mo the most uh, key figures, uh, researchers are Sebastian Felken and Klaus Pias, both uh, German uh, professors at Leuphana uh, University in Lüneburg. Sebastian Felken did his master uh, thesis on Project Cybersea uh, on 2004, and Klaus Pias wrote a couple of articles on the project uh, also during uh, those days in, in, mid, in the mid 2000s. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the project, the, the, the thesis, the master thesis by Felkin uh, was mainly focused on the operations group. And I, I think it's also fair to say that uh, these projects, the media historical projects, researchers uh, or researchers uh, can be described as a scientific discourse, the, the tracing of scientific discursive echoes connected to Project Cybersyn. For example, in the case of Sebastian Felkin's project or research, uh, he uh, spends in the thesis a lot of time connecting uh, Leibniz uh, work on uh, government management, so to say, with uh, Project Cybersyn and particularly the operations room. On the other hand, the second pilot, the social STS, we have as a key figure, Eden Medina, who is probably uh, the scholar with the most robust uh, uh, body of work on Project Cybersyn. Uh, uh, she did her PhD thesis on Project Cybersyn um, in the year he, he, he defended and presented the thesis uh, in the year 2005. And actually later she published uh, the book, uh, Cybernetic Revolutionaries uh, with the MIT Press uh, Publishing House uh, in 2011. Andrew Pickering also has uh, devoted some, 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 some work to the case. For example, in his book, uh, The Cybernetic Brain, which is actually about the life and work of the main uh, British cyberneticians, uh, he uh, spends about 20 pages discussing Project Cybersyn in the chapter dedicated uh, or devoted to the work and life of Stafford Beer. And I would say that this pilot could be described uh, as the tracing of the social technical relations surrounding and sustaining project cybersyn. But I propose and I argue uh, that something else could be done regarding project cybersyn. And my work focuses on the non-discursive practices sustaining project cybersyn and sustaining the emergence of project cybersyn. And because of that, I argue or I ask what could be the role of the agency of the machine in the emergence of project cybers? I hope this can be a little bit more clear through the presentation or after the presentation is done. Because of that, because what I'm saying, uh, I could say that my main object of research with my project is what has been called the techno episteme, which is a sort of knowledge which, which emerges from the machine, from the agency of the machine, but also a certain type of mode of organization, which I call technopolitics. So again, a mode of organization with, which also emerges from the machine, but through this techno through this knowledge derived from technology, from machines. In, 
in a Foucauldian way, we could put this as an actualization of what the philosopher called the knowledge power complex, okay? So now let me jump to what I call conditions of possibilities. These conditions of possibilities refer, as I said before, to the emergence of a certain cybernetic thinking in Chile, in Chile between the years, between the late 1960s and early uh, 1970s. Uh, these conditions of possibilities do not explain totally the emergence of Frederick Cybersyn, but do explain in a sufficient way the emergence of this uh, cybernetic thinking, which receives Frederick Cybersyn in 1971 on. Today, there are, I'm, I'm tracing three ways of psychology the way of, the, of system engineering, the way of tele-economications, -economic, and the way of the living and of machines. Uh, because of the time, I'm talking today only of the last one. So in order to, to, to give you a, a general understanding of this, please uh, consider this uh, diagram. Below the horizontal axis, you have a net, a network of institutions. Above the horizontal uh, axis, you have three names and one concept. Two of those names are Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. These were two Chilean scientists, biologists, whose work became super connected with cybernetics during the 1970s and 80s especially. And that happened due their theory of autopoiesis. It is important also to understand that both Maturana and Varela worked in great connection and collaboration with Heinz von Forrester. Both Maturana and Varela visited regularly the BCL the Biological Computer Laboratory that Heinz von Forrester ran in Urbana Campaign, Illinois in the US. So I think the BCL plays in a way, a key role in the emergence of this theory of autopoiesis. This, I think this is important to understand in the sense that this way of the living and of machines is also part of a bigger network. So to give context, here we have a picture of Maturana at the center uh, at the BCL in the spring of 1974. Uh, to, his, uh, to our uh, right, we see von Forrester. And uh, on the left, we see Ken Wilson, who was von Forrester's assistant. I don't have a picture of Varela at the BCL, but I can show you this which is a, a, a picture of a manuscript wrote by, by Varela uh, that he sent to von Forrester uh, to get his comments. You can see that von Forrester stamped uh, his ex libris uh, uh, stamp on this uh, uh, manuscript. This is uh, now <clears throat> preserved at the BCL archive. So, to explain a little bit what I mean with the way of the living and of machines, we have to go to this book, uh, Autopoiesis and Cognition, which is the book written by Maturana and Barrella and through which they uh, presented more internationally uh, their notion of autopoiesis. This book was actually a translation published in 1980. So to explain what autopoiesis is, this is, these are my words in, in a very perhaps simplistic way. Autopoiesis is a biological theory aiming to explain the organization and realization of the living. Put simply, this theory claims that, the, that living organisms are autopoietic systems. That is to say, closed, non-teleologic systems that constitute 
systems constituted by the interrelation of its inner components, which through those interrelations produce themselves. That's the meaning actually of autopoiesis, self-production. And in turn, uh, they warranty the viability of the overall system. As I said, uh, this, uh, the, the, the previous book uh, referred to uh, an original book published in Spanish, of course, in Chile in 1973. So it's a, this book was contemporary to Project Cybersync. This is also important to keep in mind. And the title of that book in Spanish was different to the one in English. As we can see here, the máquinas y seres vivos, which we could translate as on machines and living beings. And I think this is very important because I argue that at the very beginning of the notion of autopoiesis, there is a friction, an epistemological friction regarding what machines were in relation to the theory of autopoiesis. While Umberto Maturana understood machines as a thought, sort of rhetorical uh, framework to explain the operations of autopoietic systems in a mechanistic way, Francisco Varela had a much more complex understanding of what machines were. In fact, I argue that Varela, Varela had a sort of mathematical machinic approach to autopoiesis. And let me give you three examples. These examples are actually papers Varela wrote. The first one is this one, <clears throat> one he wrote while he was finishing his PhD at Harvard in 1969, but it was published only, no, it was, this one was published in 1969. Uh, this was written with Porter, and as we can see with these uh, uh, example pages, what he did here was using a uh, electron microscope to probe into living organisms. In particular, uh, the uh, visual apparatus of the honeybee, very similar to what uh, Maturana had done 10 years before at MIT with his seminal paper, along with uh, uh, others uh, researchers uh, on the frog's eye. Another, the other example is this one also written while uh, he was, uh, Varela was finishing his PhD at Harvard, but this is a different one. Here with uh, Wittenen, Varela proposes a mathematical model of the behavior of the visual apparatus of the honeybee. Not only that, they wrote a software to process the information they were able to gather with this mathematical model. And finally, the third example is actually the published version of the manuscript we see we saw before, a, a calculus for self-reference. With this paper published in 1975, but written uh, in 1974, Maturana proposes a calculus, a, a logic notation and, and operation uh, to understand how self-reference operated. And this is important because before Maturana and Varela came with the term autopoiesis, they used self-reference. All the work prior to the emergence of the actual notion uh, show us that uh, they used self-reference, particularly uh, Maturana. So in a way, with this paper, what Barrel is doing is proposing a calculus for understanding autopoiesis. Uh, I, I do not have a mathematical mind, so I'm still struggling with this paper, but I, I would like to, to, to read this uh, 
quote from, from, from that article. I quote, by taking self-reference and time as our filial arachnids, so our, as our logic, through a succession of levels, we, de we dwell upon the reunion of the constituents of these levels up to our own union with the world. And thus we find a way to retrieve the unity originally lost. Through this paper, Varela claims that the separation between organisms, living organisms and uh, the environment is an artificial one, a logical one, but an artificial one at the same time. So he's proposing this logic to find a way to reconnect, to reunite uh, living organisms as human organisms with uh, their environment. So with these three papers, we have that first Varela is understanding machines as a probe to go into organisms, then as mathematical models of the operations of organisms, and later as a third element that can reunite organisms and the environment. So that's why I think there is a much more complex understanding of what machines were. And I think this friction, this is epistemic friction with his uh, scientific partner, Maturana, is quite important because this work was super influential for Project Cybersyn. Actually, the English version of their book had a preface written by Stafford Beer. So now, please let me jump to the governing principles of Project Cybersyn itself. So as Eden Medina uh, recounts both in her PhD dissertation and in her uh, book, Cybernetic Revolutionaries, when Stafford Beer, the British cybernetician arrived in Chile for the first time, he came with the final draft of his seminal book, Brain of the Firm. In this book, he presents his viable system model, which is a cybernetic model to uh, optimize the operations of a firm, of a company, of a corporate organization. This is the technical version of um, the viable system model. We have another one, which is this one, a little bit uh, small here, uh, which is also present in the book before when he explained the entire model. Uh, it's, of course, a biological metaphor. But uh, the, the technical version is more uh, interesting for us today in what refers Project Cybersyn. So this model is a model uh, formed by five levels or five subsystems. First, we have system one, which as you can see, uh, connects this divisional, uh, this division. I have to say before, uh, this model corresponds to a corporate organization. That is to say a big firm that has divisions. For example, factories, several factories. In the case of the diagram, four, but can be, can be more, of course. So system one refers to the activity happening in one division, which is encoded and then sent to a divisional regulatory center, this triangular shape there, which is not other thing that a computational processing system, which statistically processes the information, the encoded data coming from the activities of the factory. That information is then passed to what is called here divisional directory, the rectangular shape there, which is no other thing that the management board at the factory. So the local management board at the factory. Then we have system two, which is the sum of all systems one. 
And as you can see here, all divisions or all factories are interconnected. Then we have system three, which is called here corporate regulatory center, which is no other thing that a computational general center for the entire corporation. And then we have system four, which is the place in which decisions are made. And these decisions are made based on the processed, statistically processed information that went through the divisions to the uh, central uh, computational processing uh, unit, but also based on information coming from the outside. That's why those horizontal arrows going in and out. System five is the upper level, which here uh, in the diagram is presented as board level, where the big guys uh, are and which intervenes in the process only when it's necessary, only when necessary, not, not always. So this is, these four systems are actually the most important system to understand uh, pre cybersim because pre cybersim was based on the viable system model developed by Stafford Beer. So in the case of cybersim, system one refers to the nationalized factories. During Allende's government, because of the socialist policies of that government, several factories were nationalized. Factories that before uh, were part of private capitals. And uh, as part of this transformative process during Allende's uh, government, uh, uh, these uh, factories became under the ownership of the state. So system one refers to that the nationalized factories of each nationalized factory. System two refers to the net, the TELES net network that Project CyberSync implemented based on a previous tele, TELEX network the country had uh, to connect these factories to the project. Then system three, refers in the case of CyberSync to the actual uh, forecasting software suite the team developed to statistically process the data coming from the factory. And for, of course, the famous operations room. System four corresponded in the case of project CyberSync to the operations room we saw in this brochure or with this brochure. However, we have to put attention to system two, for example, because there are aspects that didn't or were not implemented in project cyber scene in the same way in which the viable system model proposed originally. Particularly, this refers to the Divisional Regulatory Center. Because the country didn't have enough computers at the time, they were not able to have a processing unit in each factory. They simply didn't have enough computers. We are talking of 1971, 1972, yeah, more or less. So they put a telex node in each factory. That is to say, a teletype machine. And they connected this teletype machine, this telex node to the central processing, processing unit of the, process, of, of, of the system of project cybersy. There was no interconnection between the factories. So the factories were connected directly to the processing uh, system. So in a way, uh, the network or the system uh, 
implemented for project cybersync was less uh, um, complex than uh, the viable system model proposed originally, okay? But there is also a difference, another difference. It has been claimed in press reports and even by Stafford Beer himself after uh, project cybersync was shut down years later, particularly if I remember well in a talk he gave at Canada, in Canada, that the operations room would have workers participation. My research so far says that that was not actually the case, or at least originally, the team working in the project didn't have that in mind, in mind, at least not originally. The operations room was designed and built for experts and government officials, which is totally consistent to what Stafford Beer actually uh, says when he describes system four in his book, Brain of the Firm. It's highly likely, of course, that during the process, they thought that having working participation in the operations room was important. Uh, but apparently that didn't happen. So far, I have been able to, to search. However, it is highly likely that workers' participation did take place, but for events that were external to predicting to project cybers in itself. When the national, nationalization of the factories occurred in Chile, workers from the factory actually joined the management board at the factories. We know that because there was an, an American, a US American anthropologist called Peter Wing who did research during that time and during Allende's time and actually during the coup, the coup d'etat uh, that terminate uh, that government too. And he wrote a book called uh, Weavers of the Revolution and also a, a couple of papers about it. And he says that he saw himself workers joining the management board at the factories. So it's highly likely that a at a local level, the information running from the factories to the computational center passed through workers' participation. And I think that's very interesting. So here we have, and, 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 and I think this image is very important because um, <clears throat> Many times uh, uh, people very freely claims that this was only a project but didn't uh, operate it. And, and actually it did. Information was sent to this central unit of uh, statistical processing and, and they were able to forecast uh, production indexes. Here in the central column, uh, not central, in the, in the wider column, we have indexes coming from factories. And in the next columns, we see uh, the uh, forecasting they were able uh, to do. So now let me jump to the final section, technobistemic reverberations. Let me read this, please. In June 1973, Stafford Beer made his last trip ever to Chile. Given the complex political scenario in the country, in which project cybersync had become the target of constant and harsh criticism, the local team decided that his presence, cyber, uh, Stafford Beer's presence, should go as unnoticed as possible. 
Therefore, the cyber edition was located at that small coastal village about 120 kilometer, kilometers west from the capital Santiago. There, Veer wrote an essay that may be seen as a somehow pessimistic corollary of Project CyberSync in particular, and in general of the uses, usage <clears throat> of cybernetics as a techno-epistemological framework for the development of socialist cybernetic futures. So I had access to this uh, essay, thanks to the support of Raul Espejo, who is the former director, director of operations of Project CyberSync, and who after the coup d'etat relocated himself uh, in England, to England. He lives there for the last four or five decades now. And he, 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 he preserves one of the most important uh, archives of the project. So of course I read and I studied and I transcribed the, the manuscript. And I can say that uh, at the core of the manuscript, there is a diagram, perhaps its most important part is a diagram. And this diagram is actually a puzzle. It is made of seven pieces of paper that one has to assemble in order to see in operation. And for assemble, assembling this uh, puzzle, one has to read the essays. So the, these are two concatenated elements, the text and the diagram. <clears throat> I, of course, redrew uh, the diagram. The diagram is complex uh, uh, and, and I don't have the time uh, to, to explain the, the diagram entirely. I will explain it for you in a more general way today. But before saying that, a few things, perhaps disclaimers also. Well, as you can see the title, uh, in the diagram is a cybernetic model of contemporary capitalism. Beer saw in June, July, 1973, that the political scenario in Chile um, announced the end of Project CyberScene and the end of Allende's uh, program. And he saw that at the center of this situation as the biggest obstacle was contemporary capitalism. So in this essay and, and this diagram, he interconnects Marxism, cybernetics and contemporary capitalism. The last time I presented this, a person uh, from the computer sciences field became very annoyed with this diagram because here Beer uses a electric engineering symbology to explain how processes go. However, the diagram actually doesn't work uh, as an actual electric circuit. It has uh, flaws, a lot of flaws in that sense. And then Medina mentions this uh, diagram also in her book. And he says that perhaps Stafford Beer's interpretations of Marx uh, are poor for some experts of uh, Marx theories. But I claim that while this is, we, we have to keep that in mind, the most important aspect of this essay and diagram is, is that he's connecting, interconnect again, Marxism, which was at the core of Salvador Allende's program. And for that reason, also at the core of uh, Project CyberSync. Cybernetics, which is of course, uh, what came to Chile with Stafford Beer and Project Cybersyn, 
one can say that uh, Project CyberSync became the union of cybernetics and Marxist socialism in Chile because of the context, but also contemporary cap capitalism is, is present here. And I think there are many rever reverberations coming from this uh, particular document to our present. Let me explain a little bit this. This area here at, in the diagram is what I call the production cluster. For that, Beer uses or present his interpretation of how Marx explained the relation between cap capitalists and workers or labor, okay? All, of course, surrounded or interconnected through capital flows. Uh, <clears throat> then we have uh, what uh, Beer uh, or what I call the government cluster. He, he doesn't use that term, but it's the government cluster uh, is a, 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 a specific piece of the, 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 the puzzle. And here, uh, he tried to explain how the government tries or attempts to relate and regulate the relation between workers and capitalists. He uh, Beer actually uses the words or the notions exploiters and exploited class. And he claims that within the government cluster, there is a class he calls, Beer calls the bureaucracy class, which it is a major obstacle for the government to actually intervene and regulate the relation between the exploiters and the exploited class. There is another cluster I call the police cluster, but we could also call the surveillance cluster, uh, which at the top had what Beers, uh, Sapor Beer calls the ruling class. And the ruling class is influencing and actually subsuming the entire system through the flow of capital, of course, but also uh, by subsuming what Beer calls the law and order. So army, um, police, the actual police, et cetera, which of course it was, was, was actually taking place in Chile at the moment because they were seeing that the army in particular could uh, turn against Salvador Allende's government which was what actually uh, happened. At the bottom, we have environmental relations. He said through the diagram in the essay that uh, contemporary capitalism was intervening excessively in the environment. And at some point, an error, error signal will come from the environment to destabilize contemporary capitalism is also important in a reverberation to our present. But the most important thing I argue is what I call the media question in the diagram and in the essay. There's a passage in which um, Beer says that because of the evolution of uh, electronic technology, he says, or electric technology, I don't remember well, and the software milieu, he uses that term, software milieu. The channels, both exploiters, but also the exploited class use to connect to the government or with the government will become much more complex. And that, 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 that was a good thing because that complexity in the channel offered, particularly to the exploited class, more opportunities to influence back to the government or the government, okay? That's very important. He actually is referring here silently to a project he actually designed, which is he called the People Project and Eden Medina in her book calls Cyber Folk. Uh, I can talk a little bit later about it, but we was actually uh, preoccupied about how the people 
could influence the decisions made by the government. Because he saw that the original version of pre privacy was not enough for that. That's why he created this satellite project called uh, the People Project. However, in the diagram, in the essay, suddenly he stops uh, this uh, uh, speculation about uh, electric technology and the software media, and he goes to what he calls the media, basically TV, the press, and radio. And he claims that the media is actually subsumed by the ruling class to deviate the attention of the exploited class and nullify it. So that his final expl explanation about the role of the media here. But I think the previous speculation is much, much more interesting for us uh, today. So reverberations, of course, you may know, or you may not know, that Chile, the place, the country in which all these events took place, uh, had in 2019, so three years ago now, or almost three years ago, in October uh, 2019, a so social uprising, a huge social uprising which change, changes everything in, in, in Chile, so to say. Authorities then claimed that nobody saw this coming. As a Chilean, I am a Chilean, I can tell you that's not true. People was manifesting, trying to channel their uh, uh, lack of satisfaction about how things were uh, going in Chile for the last 30 years, but the political class did nothing. So the social uprising uh, happened. So because of that, many things are happening now. The, 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 the constitution, the country inherited from the dictatorship that terminated Salvador Allende's government, a right and a string right wing uh, dictatorship uh, imposed a constitution, a very right wing and a still right-wing constitution to the country, which is still uh, in place, but we are now having this uh, constitutional assembly because of this uprising, uh, and they are changing the constitution, hopefully. So we wrote with my friends and colleagues, Dusan Cotoras, uh, Joaquin Serrané, uh, well, and myself, a paper you can find online in which we, trace this process and we speculate how what we called the software milieu could have participated in the social uprising and the uh, current process of uh, uh, redefining our constitution in Chile. So again, media question, I think is a tremendous reverberation that comes and go between cyber scene and our present. And I think it is, of course, super relevant to Chile, but I would say it's also expandable to other uh, horizons. And perhaps you know, maybe not, that we are having a new president, president-elect, as they say, Gabriel Boric. And Boric is super young to be a president-elect. He, he just turned a few days ago, 36. 10 years ago, he was actually uh, and a student uh, uh, representer. He was at the center of uh, the protest uh, 10 years ago. Then he became uh, uh, a, a representative at, at the Congress and now he's president elect. And many, many, I would say, of the aspects that Beer traced with this diagram I just showed, were part of a uh, Boric campaign. So the struggle of the working class or the exploited class, the influence of the ruling class, 
how capital manages everything in Chile in particular, the role of the armed forces or the, 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 this cluster, the, this police cluster, the environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, also the media issues. So to end, I would like to read uh, this text, which is part of a text <clears throat> we also wrote uh, with Dusan Kotoras and Joaquin Serone, in which will, will be published very soon at a digital uh, exhibition called After Progress, uh, put together by Gold, Goldsmith University. Uh, we call this text Three Atmospheres of Fiction and Theory for Post-Capitalism Struggles. Uh, and of course, it relates to Chile. I quote, on the morning of 11 September, 1973, the last message of the democratically elected Chilean president, Salvador Allende, was broadcasted. A message of hope for the Chilean workers aired through radio portales. While the La Moneda government palace suffered a withering assault by the military and air force, he said the following words. Go forward knowing that sooner rather than later, the great avenues will open again where free men will walk to build a better society. Minutes later, his body was found lifeless by the occupying troops. Thousands of dissidents were tortured, murdered, and thrown into the sea from Navy helicopters during the upcoming years. Thus, what one day was tantamount to an unprecedented future eventually became taboo. A turning point in history that built a wall to distance itself from a past future impossible to re-edit. However, Again, these words were spoken again on October 25th, 2019, when more than 2 million people, after intense days of protests, marched through the great avenues of Santiago against the political economic model inherited from the dictatorship. The impossible presence of Salvador Allende redefined the relationship between what is no more and what is no yet. He embodies the ghost of future past that haunts the streets of Santiago defining our history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diego. Yeah, I think we still have uh, some time left now for uh, Q&A. I prepared some questions. If you have um, questions, you can put them into text or signal me and you can also speak up. Um, but yeah, I think while you wait, maybe I, I uh, make a beginning here and uh, thank you again, Diego, uh, for the presentation. And linking to the seminar we had, um, the, the main interest that it drives me also is, is the ultimate vision that, that was behind uh, CyberSyn, where I, after reading in Medina's book and also your text, where I still not sure where to situate it in, in thinking of economic system. And, and for example, at the moment, while the project was alive, there was still a market economy in, in Chile and also the nationalized uh, factories they were producing for markets. So there was commodity production still in place. And I, I wonder what the, the end goal of the whole project uh, was. And, and especially uh, from, from the question on, I think uh, when thinking back about the the di diagram you showed of the viable system, what's happening maybe at uh, the uh, system free, yeah, where, where these 
um, information are processed and also uh, sent back to the to the periphery, uh, one could say. Mm, and and I wonder, is this really just to 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 uh, as an information network, or was this idea to expand in something more that simulates more something like a planned economy of the Soviet style, where you have a, a center that actually uh, pre processes uh, the information and, and gives instructions back where where uh, in, in Medina's book you you also had this um, if I remember right this idea of uh, that it sh should the information sh should support the intuition of the of the management more or less uh, that, that that's not really binding in in, in a way and yeah this so. Uh, I, so, I, this is so stupid. <laughs> I should have, I, I should have um, just um, made the option that you people don't have to unmute themselves. This is totally on me. Now I have to open the. This, uh, yeah, no, no. I, I have to ask you to unmute yourself. This is totally uh, yeah. controlling. Now is it working? Okay. Yeah. No. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, the main challenge the government of Saloya had uh, was to improve and to maximize internal production. And they, they, they knew that uh, their program will face a lot of uh, obstacles, given the, cons the context of Cold War, particularly. Uh, Latin America, uh, particularly because of Cuba, uh, was sort of a, 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 a main target uh, of the US uh, especially. And we know that uh, uh, when uh, Salvador Allende uh, uh, ran for, for, for the presidency and uh, people understood that, that he, he, he had real chances, uh, the US government uh, started to, 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 to move their pieces. And there are actually uh, revealed documents about it. So uh, I end this government knew that they needed a system to maximize production. And at the same time, they knew that uh, the network of companies under the umbrella of the government would increase because of the, uh, the national, na nationalization uh, process. So first of all, Project Cybersyn's goal was to create a technology to optimize the management of this uh, newly more complex uh, economy managed uh, by the state and then uh, introducing the necessary uh, information to maximize production in each factory, at each sector, and then uh, at each sector of the economy and then of the industrial economy and then for the entire uh, industrial economy. Uh, <clears throat> So I would say that, first of all, and I'll, uh, regarding what it is claimed in, in not only in, in Beer's uh, recount of the project, and uh, the second edition of, of the 1981, I think, edition of Brain of the Film has a few additional uh, chapters recounting the story of Project Cybers. Uh, but also uh, when one goes to uh, the Stafford Beer Archive, now preserved at Liverpool, um, in John Moore's University, and we uh, uh, analyze and study the, the, the reports from the time, cyber scene was meant to be, first of all, an information system for the management of the economy to make decisions based 
on that information, processed information. Uh, so uh, the in, in Medina, 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 it is clear about this uh, in her book uh, that they didn't want to replicate uh, centralized uh, economic planning as they did in uh, the Soviet Union. And I would say that that, that decision obeys mainly to the very nature of uh, Stafford Beer's career and the nature of the viable system model itself. Uh, at the heart of the model is this notion of recursion. So within each division, as we saw in, in, in the diagram of, of, of the viable system model, one can find entire a, a, a model itself. So a division, a factory should operate in the same way as um, the entire uh, system operated. And that meant that each factory, each division had a fair level, level of autonomy to optimize its own operations. Then each sector of the industrial economy, which agglutinated a few factories, also had a fair amount of autonomy to optimize its production. And then the general system. So uh, in that sense, because of this uh, uh, fair degree of autonomy uh, at each level of recursion, uh, they claim that this was not a uh, uh, centralized uh, planned economy. Mm. Uh, as I see no questions yet in the chat and no hands raised. Ah, Ranjit, please. Okay, uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay, excellent. Uh, hi, Diego. Uh, this was really wonderful and generative. Um, um, so thank you so much for that. My, my question is a little, bo little bit kind of, I guess, speculative in nature. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Boric's uh, comments after re-election that Chile was the birth of neoliberalism and will also be the end of it. Um, and it, it makes me think uh, of kind of, again, media theoretically, um, sort of media uh, technologies uh, in and around cyber sin uh, and media technologies of neoliberalism. Uh, I'm more specifically thinking here of logistical media softwares, SAP and so on and so forth that organize so much of like global production and consumption and logistics at large. Uh, and a number of scholars of logistical media have written about it. I mean, I'm thinking of Miriam Posner here, Ned Rossiter, a bunch of them. Uh, I'm wondering if you could uh, speak to either the relationships between the kinds of epistemic visions embedded within these kind of top-down heavy planning software, uh, not just software, I mean, cyberspin is, in, is significantly far more than that, um, and uh, sort of logistical infrastructures uh, that exist under neoliberal governance strategies. And two, if, if there is if there are things to be learned from what quote unquote works, and you know, we can put pressure on whether the logistical uh, uh, software under uh, and, or, or, or logistical infrastructures under neoliberal governance work or not. But I'm wondering if there are things uh, to be learned from this side of organizing the economy um, that has been prominent since then for how cyber sin went down or uh, similar approaches may emerge or die in, in the present and in the future kind of post-capitalist uh, modes of uh, operation. I don't know if that makes more sense, but I'm more trying to put those three, two things together and asking you to kind of speculate on it. Yes. 
Thank you for the question. Uh, I, will, I, I would like to answer uh, that question in a, in a general way, not in, in not, not in a technical way, because uh, just because. Um, first, uh, we did uh, in that paper I showed, uh, the one which is already published, uh, wrote speculatively precisely about uh, this, uh, this issue. Uh, so what I'm saying now is, 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 is part of a, a collective uh, process of thinking I have had with uh, my peers, uh, Dusan and Joaquin. Um, First of all, I think uh, this is not necessarily part of my research, of my doctoral research, but it is part of my research in, in a more uh, open way. Uh, I think we can find a first path to understand the contradictions and possible connections between uh, technologies of neoliberalism and capitalism and technologies of um, post-capitalism through Mark Fisher. I think that that's, that's perhaps more or, le more or less clear for many of us uh, moving around uh, these uh, topics. Um, also, of course, but many of the uh, many of the people from the accelerationist group, um, Nick Nisek in particular, in particular as an economist has wrote about it. Um, and perhaps in a more technical way, I would say that um, the actual technologies are still for um, pushing a, a process of uh, post-capitalistic emancipation uh, need to be developed. Uh, there are elements that are perhaps present and I am not an expert so uh, on that, but I think that blockchain is a framework that can offer opportunities to explore in that area. But in general, many um, or some more encrypted uh, social networks do play nowadays, I think, a role in this um, uh, field of potential emancipation. It is true that these technologies, and I'm thinking now of, in particular of examples as Telegram and Signal, uh, have a sort of ambivalent uh, position, right? Uh, that's true, but I think that's the very nature of these sort of technologies. So I think, um, <clears throat> Perhaps this technical horizon that's already there and of course needs more development needs to be uh, coupled with a more clear political commitment towards that technical horizon. I think in, only in that way, people like activists, but not only activists, could understand that they need to, or they could embrace this sort of technologies to uh, go through support and push a process uh, that goes beyond uh, neoliberalism, at least a process that we could call a post-capitalism. -capital I have to insist what I'm saying now is part of a more collective process of uh, reflection. Um, and we actually in, in, in that um, um, exhibition, 
for which we wrote a, a, a fictional a theory fiction uh, piece, uh, we refer to this <clears throat> phrase that Boric quoted that Chile uh, will become just as was uh, the birthplace of neoliberalism will become its end. And it is interesting because that was actually a graffiti uh, made during the Chilean uprising that went viral. Um, so yes, I think that's enough. <clears throat> he wants to, to speak, I think. No? Oh. Thank you. Um, we still have a question. Um, I need you um, in the chat uh, by Renzo and Renzo saying, uh, thank you, Diego, for your presentation. I have a question. You present us a techno epistemic view in the socialism Chile from the beginning, uh, beginning uh, 70s, taking this techno epistemic view from Simon Don, which develops through a, a reticular framework where he indicates that between man and nature, a technogeographic medium is created that is only made possible by intelligence, episteme of man. In that sense, what do you think are these key points that are generated to this network that is interconnected techno-epistemically in Chilean culture in, the, uh, in that moment that is imminently without transcendental reference cosmological or rational schematism, technical. Thanks. Well, yeah, uh, <clears throat> well uh, thank you, Renzo. I'm not sure if I will be able to, to answer that um, properly, but I will try. And perhaps not uh, with a, this sort of uh, so uh, accurate attention to Simon Don's work. The reason why I decided that one of the one of the conditions of possibility that uh, I wanted to present for this talk was uh, the one connected to Varela's work in particular. Uh, relates, I think, to your question. Um, while Maturin Barella and Renzo knows that, so this is for perhaps for the people here at the room or somebody else. Uh, when Maturin and Barella was developing their theory of uh, uh, autopoiesis, they were actually in constant contact with uh, the cyber scene team. Uh, so there was a conversation going on there. And as I said, then Stafford Beer participated writing at the, pre the preface for the English version of their book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a connection there. And as I showed uh, through his uh, self-reference calculus, Barella was thinking of a mathematical logical union between humans as organisms and the environment. And in a way, I think, at least in the mind of Stafford Beer, cyber scene could operate uh, as a sort of, in this case, machinic system that could reconnect the people with its or their uh, political environment in this case. So I think there are again reverberations between what you are asking and uh, Project CyberSync when we pay attention to these uh, conditions of possibilities that in a way informed project cybersync, perhaps not as directly as uh, one could uh, speculatively uh, say, 
but more in a more uh, indirect way. I hope in a way that answers or is close to answer your question, always a complex question. Um, then we have uh, Dusan next. Hi, Diego. I think that uh, one of the case of analyze related to the actuality of cybersyn can be found in the difference between the open machine and the closed machine. The former is sensitive to the environment and the later is not. Uh, there one finds a, a similarity between the management machine called cybersyn and the legislative machine of the constitutional convention actually but are open to the environment, unlike the totalitarian states and the 1980s uh, constitution. So in that uh, context, I have a problem about how to claim the concept of autopoiesis in the present times as a radically, radically closed system, operationally closed system. What, what do you think uh, about this relation between the openness and the closure posed by these machines in the relation to the concept of autopoiesis as a closed system. Yeah, perhaps I could I could uh, paraphrase uh, Dusan's uh, questions to expand it. Actually, Dusan's uh, um, work or in our Dusan and Joaquin are part of uh, a small independent collective we have. And uh, Dusan has claimed in several opportunities that uh, we can compare uh, uh, both uh, cyber scene and the constitution imposed by the late the, 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 the dictatorship that ended uh, cyber scene and Allende's government, uh, both as machines. But, uh, Cybersyn as an open machine and the constitution, which, which was a deep neoliberal constitution, the one imposed by, by Pinochet, as a closed machine. So we have two opposite machines, one after another. Uh, this is a more uh, theoretical, conceptual uh, proposal, particularly developed by Dusan, uh, which I found super, super interesting. And yes, it is interesting because uh, it is true, and I read this, this, this definition of what autopoiesis was. Um, and it was conceived in effect as a closed system, uh, particularly for Umberto Maturana, who was at the time sort of the leading scientist in this duo. Uh, Autopoietic systems or closed machines or closed systems, only uh, concerned with their own organization. So, how could, uh, how can autopoiesis be connected to cybersyn and more importantly to our present when apparently? It is open machines, the ones we need for go through these steps of uh, economical political emancipation. Um, I have the impression, and this is a very, very incipient uh, thought, that right there uh, in what uh, Varela's proposes with his calculus for self-reference, we can find an answer in which or to which the closeness of autopoiesis is somehow opened through this mathematic, ma ma mathematic or mathematical machinic 
uh, approach. He claims that this logic, this calculus for self-reference as a third element, he says, can reunite uh, organisms with their environment. I tend to think that in, in that case, one could claim starting from, but not only with uh, Varela's thinking regarding machines through this particular paper on calculus for, self, for self-reference, but uh, math a sort of mathematical machine could operate as an opener. Uh, but this is super theoretical, of course. Uh, uh, it was not actually what uh, Cybersyn attempted, but it is a it is a way in which I think we could update still speculatively and theoretically um, project Cybersyn to our present uh, in conversation, so to say, uh, with an actualization of autopoiesis. An actualization of autopoiesis. I hope that answers the question. Um, Dusan writes in the chat, yes, I agree. I think that this article by Marilla, there's a clue to read the structural couplings as networks or reticular structures in the sense that Renzo asks. Okay. Um, yeah, then uh, George. Hi, Diego. Um, thanks for the presentation. It's fascinating. Um, so I was just thinking that so a few years ago um, on what would it would, would have been the kind of 45th anniversary of the uh, of the coup of a throwing a end day I went to a, a screening of um, Patrizio Goodsman's Battle for Chile you know, and this four-hour opus dealing with the kind of great reactionary onslaught against the revolution and I was struck at the time because this was after um, there had obviously been a great amount of I, particularly on the left about after Eden Medina's book um, and I was struck at the complete absence in in this account of the revolution uh, of uh, of this cybernetic imaginary um, and of project Cybersyn uh, and also for instance in the, uh, the book Conversations with the Ende by uh, with Rishi Debray which it was quite influential, especially for, um, you know, in the French and the British uh, leftist, leftist scene and the way in which they assimilated what they took to be the lessons of the um, Chilean socialist experience. There again, there seemed to be uh, uh, not such a foregrounding of this, um, this aspect or this particular distinction to uh, Chilean socialism and the NDA project. And so I'm just wondering, I'm curious about, because now, of course, most people would automatically, uh, if they're informed about um, ANDA and uh, uh, popular unity, they would understand and immediately call to mind Project Cybersyn. So I'm just, it seems to me, so I, I, I'm, perhaps this is captured by your, uh, your uh, resonances, Framing or um, sorry, was it resonances or um, I was very muted. I can't. Uh, I did take notes, but yeah, whether or not this is, uh, I'm just yeah, maybe some reflections from you on whether or not this is something that appears to have a kind of centrality to the ref to the project historically because of the fascination it has for us, uh, or why it was kind of absent at the time, say in the 70s, which is both of these. Uh, the film and the book, early 70s, late 70s. Um, why, why was it uh, somehow not included? Was it because perhaps um, there was yet to emerge the kind of grammar or uh, political understanding that could assimilate something like, like a machinic socialism of this, um, of this kind, uh, incorporating the ideas of autopiasis and all the rest of it? Um, yeah, just I'm just curious about your, your views on it. Thank you. Yeah, super interesting. Uh, 
Well, in 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 Eden Medina's book, uh, Cybernetic Revolutionaries, uh, she's very clear in that um, Stafford Beer himself changed a lot uh, through uh, Project Cybersyn. I, I, I don't remember the phrase he uses, uh, she uses, um, but it's something something like Stafford Beer arrived in Chile as one sort of character and lives Chile in a very different way. And that's true, uh, that's true. And I, I think that's part of the answer to that, to that question. If we analyze Stafford Beer's career, uh, before CyberScene, he was a consultant at Britain uh, for great corporations. So I think it's not wrong to say, even if, if he claimed later on that he was an old fashioned socialist, I think it wouldn't be wrong to say that before Project Cybers in itself, B was a capitalist, if not a neoliberalist. Uh, but it's true that the things happening in Chile had a tremendous influence in his, uh, I, was, I was about to say minor, <laughs> in his uh, thinking. Um, um, and later on, why Project Cybersync is developed, uh, two things happen. First is uh, the people project or cyber folk as Eden Merina calls it in her book. Uh, which was an idea uh, designed and actually uh, tested in a very, very uh, small, uh, uh, at, a, at a very small scale with a prototype uh, by Beer. The, proto the, the proto prototype was actually developed by his son, but they tested the prototype at Chile. They wanted to give the people, I mean, the people sustaining Allende's process, they wanted to give them a tool, a cybernetic tool through which they could actually in real time influence the decisions made by the decision makers. This is, as I understand it, a way to uh, accept that Project Cybersync, at least originally, was a tool made for experts. They noticed that, and they, they noticed that that was against the very nature of Salvador Allende's program. So they attempted to, at the heart also of the government of Salvador Allende, there were a lot of leftist technologists, and they were convinced that in order to implement and make the policies designed by the government uh, successful, they needed a complex and high technology. I think this is super important and relates uh, to the question, uh, one of the questions before, but Other people in the government also uh, made or uh, demanded attention regarding how the actual people would participate of this cybernetic uh, framework of mass emancipation. And I think a project cyber folk or uh, the people project, uh, is, it is one answer to this situation or a, an attempt to give a channel to the people to participate of what we could 
call the cyber scene system as a general thing. At the beginning of my research, I tended to think that cyber folk or the people prick was uh, something different uh, than project cyber scene itself. But towards the development of the project, one understands that in a way, it is not only an appendix, it's an extension of the project. And a, 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 an extension that uh, was not actually implemented, but I think it's fair to think and to say that it was an attempt to extend the project. And the other aspect that could answer uh, your question, George, is the essay that Beer writes uh, in June, July, 1973, and that I mentioned before. I would say that the entire argument of the paper, of, of the essay, of the uh, diagram, uh, is trying to trace what would be the conditions to give or to incorporate, to really incorporate the people to, to a transformative cybernetic socialist process. That's the claim. It's basically, can you, can you update, actualize, Karl Marx's account from the 19th century through cybernetic and then find a path through contemporary cap capitalism to a new state. I think that's the beauty of that uh, somehow desperate text. Beer is facing that, that in a way, cyber scene in the way is operating in its first uh, versions uh, at that moment will not be enough, basically, because of the constraints. I mentioned that because of technological constraints, the, the network or of project cyber scene had to be less complex as the viable system model uh, actually proposed. And what could one could say, and I could say, I actually say that perhaps that was one of the reasons why um, Project Cybersync actually was not able to process all the variety coming from uh, the external environment. One of those externalities being, of course, all the opposition, all the blockades, all the all the all the maneuvers uh, uh, done by the opposition, uh, etc. So, there, there there were attempts to 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 clearly incorporate what. Um, the documentary, the Battle of Chile depicts, I mean, the basis of the government of the popular unity, which was actually the people, a, a process that, at least in Chile is in many ways unique. Uh, and I think that Beer himself understood at some point, that uh, project cyber needed to be expanded. And later on, he even thought, and this is my, my reading, that was not enough. For some reason, in a way, um, Eden Medina discarded uh, in her book, the essay I'm uh, mentioning before. Um, I wrote a paper about it, in which got initial good response from a interesting journal. I, they gave me a lot of uh, comments. Anyway, I have to rewrite a lot, but I hope being able to, 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 to present uh, particularly the diagram in a more clear way 
in the context that, that surrounded the diagram. But because I think, I truly think it is a very precious uh, document to understand um, how Project Cybersyn concludes and how actually can reverberate or resonate to our present. I think this was a nice ending words and um, being deprived of seeing how this process might have unfolded in the past. One could only hope that uh, the future of Chile maybe or some other country or some other place uh, might pick up this tale and uh, keep on developing new ideas, learn from the past and, and see how this what uh, Stefan B also called this effective freedom of, of reconciling centrality with decentrality, uh, yeah, might uh, unfold in the future. And and yeah, with this, I would end here. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Diego, for coming. And um, yeah, we I think go with the students in a bit more informal setting now, so uh, we can keep the discussion there. And if you have uh, any more questions, uh, Diego. Um, to Diego, write him an email. Uh, George, ask for the essay you just answered. So with this, bye-bye. Thanks and see you. Thank you.